Hello everyone, today we talk about Russian warfare from the 11th to the 14th century roughly. This is the first part uh, of two, given that there is really a lot of stuff to say about this regional history of warfare series. And it's interesting because it sort of captures the heart of this single countries and homogeneous cultural uh, areas that you can at some point start, you know, uh, watching geographically, like, you know, moving various cardinal uh, directions, depending on where you want to look at. For example, I already made one about the Bulga Bulgars, about the Hungarians, about the Poles recently. Uh, and so you can appreciate, because it's based uh, as a series, as you've seen uh, already, on also the, the influences received from the outside, not just the peculiar characteristics of local warfare and largely these military cultures were very similar to one another, right? At least compared to, you know, differences, the divides that you can see in, in contemporary in the contemporary era. Uh, plus we have made a series uh, last year that if you remember was about Eurasian steps warfare and it might uh, in fact be entitled like this and maintain a focus on the uh, nomadic military cultures of the Eurasian steppes, uh, it also uh, skirted this this uh, broader uh, area. We talk about the Rus a lot, uh, also about the Baltic peoples, uh, etc. So it can't be connected and intertwined. This, this this is what I aim to do with with these series. That at some point, end right, uh, even though there is really a lot of episodes still to make. Uh, to sort of agglutinate, first of all, all those, um, let's say, videos uh, with narrower uh, team as far as, I don't know, historical military units, tactics, organization, whatever, are concerned, but also providing this literal tapestry of, say, full medieval uh, warfare for all these regions and looking at different aspects uh, one at a time. Right. Uh, I made, for example, I, I usually make them all in, in one in one video uh, at a time. But uh, as it happened for recently, the Byzantine uh, uh, warfare ones, for example, it's so much stuff that you must split it. And today, in fact, we will just look at some aspects of this warfare and go on uh, in the other in the other episode. So, one interesting aspect about um, the Rus is that was really vast geographically. Um, so definitely by the standards of the various nations of medieval Europe, this extended. It doesn't matter how in uh, on, on a less uh, densely populated and uh, connected at least by uh, land routes and um, sort of just poor uh, area in many ways it was being colonized throughout this time uh, by the Eastern Slavs further towards the east up to a frontier that we can't quite in fact trace right the video about the Volga Bulgars talks about this from the say looking at this phenomenon from coming from the west uh, geographically but exactly for this reason it sort of makes more sense uh, territorially to compare it to uh, Eurasian nomadic states right uh, that uh, the same Rus border as, as you know uh, in the south uh, and in the southeast um, as we will see, the Rus is also different um, in, within itself. There is no doubt. We will see how, of course, it was a big difference, I'd say, between Novgorod and Kiev, or between uh, properly the, you know, the more uh, the the, the Rusian Palatinate and the, in fact, the the frontier uh, with the Bulgars. And as we have seen in other videos that I made about the origin of the Kievan Rus and and more about, generally speaking, the relation. Um, the, the 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 creation of the of the Russian state, as much as the interaction with the Byzantines, with other um, peoples from Central Europe, that actually shared in pre-Mongol times a lot more with, um, or better, it's the other way around. It's what we call Eastern Europe today that was properly a product, right, of the Mongol invasion. I mean, there is no doubt of whatsoever on it. Uh, before this, the Rus was instead much, but I mean much more similar to Central Europe uh, in many ways. Uh, the, the closest country was definitely Poland, culturally, um, but there are definitely some 
social political balance that was rigged by the uh, Mongol invasion and that albeit impacting other areas of, of uh, Central Europe had a much um, more categorical impact on what is in fact Eastern Europe in a cultural sense true divided from uh, this is an aspect that we tend to sort of overlook because we uh, let's be honest like even with war in Ukraine etc most I, I say it, of course with uh, still always saying that Westerners are t- to this date and are going to stay for for a very long time the single most educated people on earth but still on average of course uh, let's be honest the Westerners even when including um, these um, let's say the, the West in a broad sand broader sense so even uh, countries from the uh, from the former Eastern Bloc, like literally, do not know anything about the history of these countries, and and the the ones that especially try to do so because they have to explain you why I don't know these lands belong to whichever. Um, uh, very often are the ones that literally you know do not know anything at all. Like it's not just looking at a map for two years because you have to act pseudo sophisticated about having uh, allegedly. Um, uh, a strategical education that actually makes you see in deep historical perspective what what happened to these lands. I made a series on uh, Ukrainian history, if you're interested, by the way, that deals with some aspects that are really fascinating from um, from more or less like the, the Renaissance to the the 20th century. Uh, and again, that's in part why we take our time to to describe this war, right? So the first principality of the Rus, as you know, emerged during the 10th century. This was in part the result of Norse penetration along the great rivers uh, that uh, crossed the region, mainly from north to south, and in a sense, um, as an offshoot of the state of the semi-nomadic Turkic Khazars, right, that were essentially the dominating power uh, before the rise of the Kivan Rus in the area. They were destroyed, in fact, by the latter, as you know. And uh, this tells you a lot because Kiev, in particular, was this last uh, Amon post, say, of, of, of sanitary, um, say, of civilization, in, in a way. Um, if we specify everything that wasn't nomadic, right? But that at the same time was also part of the Khazar dominion. Not differently, let's say, how from how the Mongols would later establish uh, many uh, Rusian states as uh, clients on their own, right? And, and it was such a central position uh, on a major river, the, the the most gifted, in fact, one that from which the Rus could could develop definitely, uh, and already enriched by the presence of this the 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 Khazars, their their officials, the the fact that this was not just a trade center, but it had a strategic function from which you could reach more easily, also with, with a proper fleet. The Black Sea from there, as you know, the Rus would attack Constantinople, but also all the, the, in fact, this the western part of the Eurasian steppes were, as you know, also the, the Vikings had uh, pushed themselves, uh, uh, guiding the, also groups of Slavs that had supported them. And when we look at the Varangians, at, at the end of the day, they were prevalently Slavic, right? Uh, this is something that has been especially in later historiography, re- reaffirmed, because, of course, there is a, an enormous legacy at stake, as you understand. Um, but it, it's obvious that the, the, the Eastern Slavic world was was coalescing uh, and expanding uh, in the process, just like the rest uh, of Europe, would be in a more contained way in terms of power, but still um, surely a superior one over the the great um Kaganates, right of of the turkic steps that had in a sense made their day right it's not before the arrival of the mongols that 
you have uh, that new and last wave of steps conquerors uh, that in fact achieve if you look at even the, the boundaries of their settlement that was fundamentally still the, the one between the steps and the sanitary world in fact did not uh, say last um, too much at least the word this Turkic uh, peoples that were shattered by the events themselves I made different videos about for example the Lipka Tartars uh, similar topics but the idea being that the sanitary world was obviously uh, more resourceful more prepared, more uh, more stable, really. Like the the material culture, the organization, that the political compaction was, was stronger. That's how the Kievan Rus eventually crushed the same Khazars. But it's worth remembering it because we tend to like the barbarian for some strange reason. Whenever the thing gets pop culture, let's say, and that's a pretty distasteful thing. Um, if you look at this vast region that is also difficult in fact to um, to to delineate right on, on a map because we do not even know technically uh, uh, how far and how you know consistent uh, lead this um, Eastern Slavic uh, expansion went we know pr we know pretty far actually but there, there would be a lot to say about the remains of some other um, ethnicities such as the Iranian ones but also and especially and you talked about this in the video about the Eurasian steps for, for how much peoples like the same Khazars had sedentarized by the time they were taken out uh, it was a land of forests and woodland that's the actual uh, environment right the steps are another thing even when the Mongols come to exact tributes they, they invade um, they they come to threaten as far as Lithuania etc. They actually don't like to get into forest. Uh, they want to remain out of that, right? They have less advantages. The Slavic militias are fierce. It's definitely not a good place where to fight in the first place. Albeit we should point out as always that the Mongols were the ones that you know invaded and crushed the Rus uh, in winter. Just for those also who um, complain about the story, it's impossible to do so. Uh, and and also for the ones actually that always whined it, you know, uh, the the Mongols retreated from 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 Europe because in that year it rained in Hungary, man. So they 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 didn't know how to keep their bowstring, um, you know, dry. And so that that's the thing. Uh, you know, uh, Russian winter. Uh, yeah, the, the the single driest weather you can find. Um, so. Um, you want to appreciate this as far as also the relentless struggle that this frontier people uh, underwent in the relation with, with the steppes folks, which is also underappreciated in terms of arms and armor development. There is a very specific sort of crescent stretching from uh, the southwest to the northeast from the Balkans to, in fact, um, the, the fringes properly of, of uh, Europe in the east that develops certain particular types of shields, tactics, designs, and weapons, etc., that were functional to counter steps peoples. And we will see this um, in some depth uh, in more narrowly thematic episodes. In the south, you had, as we were saying, just the open steps instead, which um, would continue actually to be dominated by nomadic peoples of essentially Central Asian culture. The interesting thing is that the north was so that this Eastern Slavic world was so more compact uh, in comparison that it was enough from Kiev, say, just to occupy certain uh, avant posts uh, in the south, right on on the Black Sea along the the, the river, especially mouths that that was the most important strategical uh, feat, and basically. Uh, getting all the revenues of that without even needing to occupy the what was in between. It was and is still step technically, where the war is being fought uh, today. If you look at the boundaries, in many ways it, it resembles uh, in a disturbing way um, really this sort of perennial frontier that had existed uh, from millennia in this regard and. Uh, there is, and uh, we will see it in part today, of course, an enormous step influence as well, especially from from the heart of the Rus, from Kiev, that has 
more resources, more power, and in this sense, greater mounted armored forces that in the finest influences that they would actually receive uh, get a lot definitely from from the steps right however and we will see it better in the other video because it pertains m more in a documented way to the later centuries but there is also and this is often overlooked a massive but i mean a massive and enormous macroscopical western influence this is often forgotten because of byzantine art that uh, canonically was uh, representing the various Russian heroes now that the, the locals had been converted to um, to Eastern Christianity and they had adopted all this artistic fashion that that same kind of crystallized iconic you know uh, in fact uh, imagery that the Byzantines use for for reasons we will see perhaps better in a history of art video but that, as you know, had very archaizing and uh, classicizing, romanizing tropes, um, as if I don't know a, a 12th century Russian prince would have looked like uh, you know late Roman uh, hero, all right? Um, we know archaeologically not only that there was an awful lot of step influence, but that the actually dominating and sort of the, the at least the um, the cult, the military culture from which the finest was drawn increasingly also as a direction was properly the West, right? We've seen it in a very clear fashion with Poland, that is a medium between, in fact, Germany uh, and Eastern Europe, where um, the, 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 the Frankish world, broadly meant, was exporting a dramatic amount of arms and armor for these nascent rising uh, Eastern European elites that found this equipment uh, extremely to their liking in spite of the fact that in, on this step frontier, as we've seen, warfare was objectively different, right? But it wasn't that much to alter significantly also that liking for the heavier cavalry the shock charges etc it is true that a typical russian heavy cavalryman would have been more even individualistically more uh more skilled than perhaps a western knight the thing is different in a, in a collective sense but even if you look at the crusaders in the near east um you realize and it's not a compliment meaning that western warfare was objectively more advanced but it's the same thing in the near east right the crusaders do not really stop their or alter in a significant way that their way of war um and from a strictly tactical point of view they proved i think very clearly if you study the military history of the crusades more often than not a superiority over peoples of uh essentially central uh asian uh tradition like the the seljuks in spite of their heavy uh persification etc but these were not very different populations, military styles we've seen in the videos about the Volga Bulgars, for example, with in fact this broader pre Mongol Turkic world uh, and uh, sort of military culture and identity. And that's the difference between the sedentaries and the nomadic in many ways. It, it's a, I'm approximating to some extent, but the essentials are basically about this. Then there is, um, let's say, the the most one of the most fascinating aspects of of course of the the Rus is its boundaries as we've seen. Um, we do not know how far north um, in the forests and tundra the Rus dominated, right? Uh, histo historically, uh, historiographically, it's a matter of debate really because uh, military cultures get blended. There, it's obvious that there were some Slavic lords settling there and exploiting the, the locals as well. But so you can you're having interesting and strange mixes that, in part, we will document now. For the rest, when you look instead at uh, at, at the south, at the west, you really um, can spot uh, connections with uh, with other European countries, right? We can make the example of Hungary uh, because there there is. Um, uh, deep, uh, especially in areas like the Russian Palatinate, especially a deep connection 
with these other states, also with Germany, with Bohemia. There's a lot going on, especially by the 13th century, after the Mongols have arrived. This, this, this is a land, as you know, that will shift even towards the papacy, as opposed to what we call the orthodox tradition. But just to make a few examples, at the Kunsthistorisches Museum of Vienna, we have preserved a beautiful um, saber known as one of Charlemagne. Right. Um, this was a um, essentially a, a diplomatic gift sent to the uh, Holy Roman Empire from the Rus in 1075. We know as far as that. The problem is we do not know exactly with where this uh, sword was manufactured because it could have been even if still it had it was a, a Russian gift. It may have been produced locally um, in the Rus or in Hungary. And the interesting aspect of this is that while straight words uh, would prevail, of course, in a, in a German context, this sword is clearly within the steppe tradition. Right? So this speaks of naturally of the uh, substantial nomadic influence present in the Rus and especially in, in the, the very center of that right, in the southern heartland around Kiev, um, which was the proper, uh, you know, uh, sender of this uh, this magnificent gift that dates, by the way, something between the tent, right, the, the sword, I mean, right, the, 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 the gift is in 1075, but this thing was older, right, it had some important meaning was manufactured likely somewhere between the mid 10th or the first fourth of the 11th century. This was a way to say look this is us. This is the type of swords that we actually use. And and it's fascinating because the uh, as you know the the Germans at that time were just emerging victorious and aggressive over the, the, the Magyars. So they would have known, you know, these swords from those encounters and the Kievans were sort of saying, well, you know, look, we, we are similar in that, um, even though, of course, there were important differences. Uh, part we will explain it now. Consider that the, the Hungarian military culture remains influenced for a very long time. Uh, up to the 13th and 14th century by properly Middle Eastern ties because uh, the one of the, the westernmost branches of the steppe ended basically in the Danubian Valley uh, uh, and uh, like through Transylvania would reach um, Hungary proper and um, this was a thing that the Magyars had maintained as contacts commercially and more Probably with areas like uh, Persia, the Caspian Sea, and these were territories, as you understand, very close to the Rus, uh, that in turn was close to those areas, we will see now, of Ugrofinnic populations from which the same Magyars had come from. So this, is, this is mind blowing, very fascinating to see how the circles close. The same Volga Bulgars had lots of Slavs, lots of Ugrofinnic peoples under their control. It was a, a regional state, really. Uh, in some ways, even more advanced, um, uh, especially at the beginning of this period, than the, the, the same rules, right? And this is fascinating. At the Museum of Mokroy uh, in Ukraine, I hope this is still preserved, um, there is a helmet uh, that was found east of Lviv, dating to the 10th, 11th century. This is Eastern, this is Slavic, but as a type, it is also to be found in places like Hungary, Poland. The directly riveted segments here are the, the main, um, say, characteristic, right? It was a particular method of construction which essentially would last longer in Eastern Europe because of Eurasian steppe influence and origin of the same type. Also the Balkans may have had uh, this type of um, helmet construction lasting longer. Made it, uh, if you're interested um, to videos about Western and Eastern Balkans, you see there also the 
the wide difference in uh, external halogen influences. There is a collection of bronze maze heads from the ex uh, Kirpichnikov dating to the 12th to 13th century. Um, these maze heads were um, collected in part also as far north as the, the Baltic Sea as, a, as an area. And they're relatively light, knobbed or, or spiked, which was, um, as we've seen in the video about medieval Poland, typical among uh, most Slavs, but also in Hungary, and even there, in fact, betraying a likely stepped origin for which the Slavs could have, and this other population uh, in Central Europe had uh, adapted to their warfare. The similarities between the Rus and Poland I already discussed in the video about the latter, so I kind of, you know, uh, advise you to look at that, just not to repeat myself um, in this video too. Also because here there is probably more Russian e uh, evidence than uh, than Polish uh, influence to to note, but um, this um, this Polish connection will will recur. We find Baltic influences as well. Um, these are all relatively clear. Uh, material cultures to nucleate when we look at this various influence on the same Russian war we can easily trace it in part because for as syncretic the the same Russian material culture was it also came to be original uh, out of that right so uh, also characteristic in its own regard uh, the eastern frontier is the bigger uh, puzzle of all right because we do not technically know again as how far the Slavs uh, reached. Uh, of course, we, we know it if we were to go more in-depth in, in a dedicated video, but military, in terms of military culture, that's the thing that interests us. We definitely know that the Russian Slavs um, gradually colonized the, the, the river valleys um, in, in, a, in, an, in a world that had been previously populated by definitely less developed and uh, also less demographically concentrated Ugrofinic tribes. We should not, however, underestimate the military qualities of the latter people and the level of actual arms and armor production that they uh, they underwent. Some of these peoples were sort of more peaceful, not that they actually were uh, or they were less warlike, but they were so, say, thin and sparsely, you know, uh, settled that even if they had some of the most traumatically violent and shockingly sanguinary um, mindset and lifestyle ever, of course, they were irrelevant in, in, a, in, in a bigger strategic picture uh, than the Rus, that simply, you know, some say, subjugated them, right, it wasn't much they could do, but of course it was guerrilla, etc., and of course if it was so far away in the frontier, nobody in Kiev really cared about it. Um, after Sadov, we have um, some weapons uh, that uh, come from the Eastern Finn tribes. Uh, they're difficult to date, because they're being more primitive weapons, you you do not know. Like they changed more slowly. They're more, they're simpler. So we can say from the eighth to the twelfth century. Um, they these populations uh, on the base of this evidence definitely manufactured and imported um, an extraordinary ensemble of arms and armor. Right, uh, there were massive uh, sabers that uh, betray a strong uh, turco mongol influence uh, coming in this case from the the south because that, that's where steps were but say uh, even before the Mongol invasions of course the say the steps were steps vowels were agitating in some way and so the these peoples would know the aftershocks this was not a, f a far west but a far east uh, again a, a, a traumatically violent environment that where you can't even explain how humans could actually leave 
uh, in in this political and military sense, not environmentally uh, in a say naturalistic sense, but that that is also shocking to say the least. But the the need for the local aristocracies to again produce import weapons it really shows you how actually you know non savages they they really were in spite of the, the wilderness and in spite of the fact again that they were extremely poor and backward materially speaking they still needed warfare and perhaps exactly because of it there were the martvans among the eastern Finns I made uh, one of the episodes from the Eurasian step for for addressing their sort of their style again extremely poor here we have some uh, arrowheads after set off uh, that we can date to between the 9th and the 11th century um, the Martvans seem in this sense to have had more in common with the Turco-Mongol peoples in terms of arms and armor and style let's say than the Western Finns, right? Uh, however, just like you would um, expect in, in in the sedentary world in European archery, there are also socketed types, socketed arrowhead types, uh, as opposed to the prevalent tank one that is, as you know, very very nomadic uh, in character. From uh, Karelia, in among the Western Finns. We have still after set of as, as a source um, the uh, a dagger sheet and, and a dagger. This could date again pretty simple weapons per se. Um, they can date between the tenth and fourteenth century widely. Uh, as you know, Karelia has a very interesting history. Uh, it was contended by the let's say the, the Russians, the the, the Scandinavians, um, and uh, even up to you know, the, the the 20th century, you know, it was eventually taken by the Soviets from the, the Finns, etc. But um, it, it was in, as a frontier area, I explained this in the video about medieval Finland, and we can talk about uh, Novgorod. We still have a lot to do, actually, uh, for, for the Baltic um, in this immediate interland. And in this case, the uh, dagger uh, sheath um, or rather what survives here archaeologically in in metal, right? The the rest would have been leather, which rotted away, have actually an awful lot in common with the sheets used as far as Central Asia, right? Uh, admittedly, the designs would have been practically simple for everyone to just to, to build them that way, but there is surely a... Uh, a military influence coming from that far, and you must imagine that in this area there would be a lot of Turco-Mongol adventurers, could be especially the hungriest ones, uh, you know, as famelic wolves that just would venture uh, to to find like uh, slaves, um, you know, to settle down as as lords, etc. Uh, all in an incredibly um, brutal periphery of other regional powers, but still. We have from the same source uh, also uh, different weapons, for example, uh, axes, uh, daggers, spearheads, scabbards, and these instead, essentially from the same area, have a lot to do, and we saw it for the video about Scandinavian warfare, in fact, with Norse influence at this time, which naturally continued also because the Scandinavians sort of became Frankish in uh, military culture, and so they contributed, especially in this more faraway places as opposed to the Germans that aimed more closely, um, at, uh, to, to export that sort of Western... Um, influence in this faraway places. The only truly developed sort of urbanized civilization you could find east of the Rus uh, was, uh, say, in, before arriving to China, all right, was the Volga Bulgar one, right? This was similar, if you want in the level of development of the Rus, as we were saying before, 
uh, it uh, laid in the middle Volga and Kama basins, so they were um, properly just like Eastern Slavs, some fortified entrenchments over the this major uh, riverways that uh, as trade um, posts uh, evolved were you know enlarged. Uh, there was a lot of slave trade um, around and contact in fact between through this the same uh, water routes between uh, the, the surrounding world, right? Uh, the Bulga Bulgars were essentially a Turco Islamic state. Um, in some ways, again, th they were even more prosper and sophisticated than the, especially the early medieval Rusian state. Uh, but they had their limits too, uh, eventually. They were hit hard by the Mongols. They sort of survived. Um, I told the story a bit. Um, as a at least in legacy, right around the same center, in spite of the devastation, it's but what happens to to the same Rus. There are interesting parallelisms to trace. Now, between the tenth and the thirteenth centuries, the Rusian eastern frontier ran basically from the the Dnieper River southeast of Kiev in a roughly northeasterly line towards the upper Kama River. That's where they connected with the Volga Bulgars. Um, the virtually undefined frontier in between um, seems to have reached um, towards the Arctic Ocean as well. Uh, and uh, in, this was properly a, not even a world, it was something else on its own. Some Scandinavian settlers, as you know, had explored and even, uh, you know, started to live in the area. Um, there were relatively peaceful interland populations, or at least ones that didn't have so many resources to, to, to waste in warfare, even though they, they did um, kill each other in, in much more, uh, say, bol say, you know, habitual ways than, than we think. We're talking about the Ugra, the Vyatka, the Trud, the Samoyed, tribes, right? And these were important because there were some resources coming from there, and uh, they had accepted fundamentally a, at least a degree of, of Rusian suzerainty. Um, they mostly dealt uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the, the Rus for the lucrative fur trade, um, and they, they had their own distinctive culture. Now, passing a bit to the evolution of Russian warfare, per se, in the early period, as we know, the Slavs had really uh, not a particularly stratified society. As a consequence, in spite of all the step influence that, as we've seen traditionally, they would go at war with very large, uh, a very large proportion of infantry. Right. These peoples always had cavalry, but it's fair to say that as far as uh, European sanitary uh, cultures were, were concerned, aside from in part the Scandinavians, but probably even less than them, the, the Slavs as well had, were the people with least cavalry. Perhaps just the, the, the Balts were, um, were underperforming in that regard. But at this point, surely they had a lot of this infantry meant also a lot of manpower, a, a balanced um, distribution of wealth that was not uh, high in absolute terms, but that would sort of um, allow the, the the freer expansion, right, um, in, in across this wider area in a more politically autonomous way. Um, we're talking again about. Mm, importantly uh, attractive lands economically but still covered in forest marshes and rivers so again very primitive um, difficult places to to live in but given the, the standards of these populations after all it was good enough to spread and and build and, and develop there according to many sources 10th century Russian infantry was, as a consequence, fairly well equipped. Uh, there is a sense that also in these major Rusian uh, river 
centers, you could find importantly uh, armed militias in almost Byzantine style. This is a bit different in the in the countryside, in the forested areas. There you would see much more poverty, but still there were lots of local woodsmen, uh, peasants, etc. that could, especially in, in this quite difficult terrain, put up a fierce fight right through guerrilla, uh, you know, uh, ambushes, you know, entrenching to the, the forests, uh, being uh, capable of launching counterattacks. They had been learning this from a very long time, right? We made a video about uh, early Slavic warfare from the magnificent uh, description made of it by the the Saudi Maurice's strategicon. And uh, generally speaking, in this eastern frontier, these guys had had to face with lots of horse archers from the steppes. Um, and given the rise of the Rus, managing even to overwhelm the latter, right? Uh, the infantry forces survived as the peasant levy known as Voi between the 11th and the 13th centuries, right? They would represent a very important balance to princely power. Uh, the Kivan Rus, as you know, would have derived from the same Rurikid dynasty installed in all these various principalities that in part had very few to do with one another, a bit like the Piasts in the, the Polish duchies, right? That's, uh, in fact, they shared power in very similar ways. They also intervened in each other's affairs. Um, and the, the local princes were naturally the, um, let's say, the expression, not just of an aristocratic elite, but also of a severely autocratic um, step-modeled one, right? This would be extremely evident after the Mongol conquest, basically the same concept of Tsarism and, you know, and, and the way it came to, to be historically much still of, of, you know, contemporary Russia is, is a pure, and I stress the adverb purely, Mongol product. Um, and, of course, the, the step uh, warlords had a completely different and much more atrociously uh, violent mentality than and it was in Europe we had in terms of balance of forces, the dichotomy that made really, in fact, the uh, Western development much healthier in terms of political, institutional, and military capacity uh, as a consequence. Um, and the Voi, the Russian peasant levy, was essentially playing, having the same function, like checking, especially in the cities, um, in the this, uh, centers, streets, the um, the power of the otherwise sort of very chivalric uh, equestrian minded uh, and very you know effective mounted elite that would have given its best out there in the fields against the nomads knowing how to maneuver whatever but as long as the the Rus remained sort of balanced by these the, the distribution of, of power between these this estates, the system sort of held, right? The collapse uh, during the Mongol invasion has been explained also through the uh, already um, accomplished erosion of these uh, town militias in, uh, I mean, just before the conquest, so that basically the same ruse was gradually going towards a more autocratic uh, profile because these um, Russian towns would never develop in spite of the size and the, the wealth, etc., as far as, I don't know, the western city-states or whatever. They were really very different places. These were not regions that had ever known urbanization in the way we intend, um, strictly speaking. They, they, they What the eastern Slavs accomplished there it was already remarkable by itself, but everything was much more private, much more sort of non-public minded than than Westerners had been reaffirming through the Roman Empire and the, uh, the the universal authorities and so on. In many ways, they considered themselves a world on their own, 
But as we were pointing out, um, the Rus also had a lot in common with other countries like Poland, like like Hungary. They weren't so different uh, before the Mongol conquest. So up to the 13th century, you want, you want to appreciate really. I made a video uh, some years ago about the Russian militia. It's one of the of those I have still to re-upload with uh, better pictures, but I can't easily do it, telling the truth now, because I have have plenty of fitting uh, creative common images for it, but you know, as long as I make new videos, I'll exploit these. Um, there was a widespread use of archery, seemingly among Russian infantry, right? Um, nothing, let's say, particularly, uh, say, developed in a collective sense. Perhaps we, we may underappreciate actually w w how capable they were. They used uh, apparently simple long bows, sometimes large semi-composite bows covered in birch bark. Uh, the latter is likely a Scandinavian um, uh, at, at least similarity, also influence likely, rather than uh, a Byzantine one that would have seen a more you know, fully composite bows, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, surely through arrowheads we're noticing before, we can grasp the, the, the really the variety, the wide variety of styles and influences. Um, but uh, the, the most important thing about this archery was the combined arm effect with the, the stopping infantry. I mean, the idea of creating some shield walls of uh, spearmen that would hold the line as the cavalry did their maneuvers out there while remaining under fire of the staff's archer and but having also their own uh, your own archers um, behind this formation to counter the enemy or jump in you know in front of, of, of the of the heavy infantry line stuff like that uh, with the hit and run tactics um, it's something that makes a lot of sense and that actually manages to edit, to to defeat, right? To keep at bay and to effectively counter the horse uh, archery uh, of the steps peoples. Uh, and this is fascinating because there was a stopping fire as far as the the heavy cavalry of the same step peoples that was in, uh, waiting to soften up again this. Uh, these ranks before crashing to that with their ultra elite that was so also numerically speaking again the Rus wins against this uh, model before the, the Mongols arrived and again there are something else compared to this what the uh, the Russians would call Svoy Pagani that means our own pagans I mean this Turks that after all had always been there from centuries at least and they um, they were out their own pagans, right? No, the ones that everybody knew as an enemy, whereas the Mongols were were something thrown out of you know, uh, the, the, of the gates of hell, and much more um, militarily, uh, you know, effective in many ways, but not particularly more advanced, right? Never make the point that the Mongols were this enormously effective military machine because they were particularly modern or updated. If you look at, I made a video about the they also the equivalent of this uh, for especially the steps um, the Mongol steps um, sometimes we, we find archaeologically that the Mongols had an incredibly backward uh, type of equipment right an incredibly underdeveloped technological level to some degree and this perfectly fits uh, actually with what we very well know that, that they were not effective because of technology right of course later the Mongols sort of um, adapt, but who are the Mongols? You see, because one thing you say, the Ilkhanate, we are technically almost Persians, right? You talk about China, that you you see, of course, that they, they the Mongols grafted over other people's sort of civilization. There were some 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 peoples in the steppes, even some basically um, irrelevant one, never heard of one uh, lost in between. They were actually even fairly wealthy and even sort of more advanced than the Mongols at some point. But the, the Mongol, say, epopee is so big, it's such a huge deal, a gigantic, an oceanic one, as they would have preferred to term it, that, um, in fact, you cannot reason through material wealth, 
right? Uh, as always, well, the great empires were about moral force, but it's important to to point out. Of course, the Kibandrus was richer than, say, Mongolia. Uh, in a, say, the average Mongol was just like basically a a wild beast living on horseback his entire life as a nomad out there in the, in the literal wilderness. Um, of course, this the Eastern Europe was richer in comparison. But still, of course, it got overwhelmed. We have a sword from Coppen, dating sometime between the 9th and 11th century. And you wouldn't be surprised to know that um, the, the closest parallels to this, as far as, especially as the hills are concerned, are to be found in Scandinavia. Right. Uh, this is obvious given that, um, especially in the southwest of the Rus, uh, you would have... Uh, even blades from properly within European tradition. Now it's complex to, to explain in such areas what European tradition would look like, but still the concept of this more, as we've seen, straight swords with um, hills that, again, they consider um, that the same Vikings imported uh, their blades, at least from from the Rhineland, right? And that Fundamentally, as we've seen in, throughout Poland, even the Rus, you have the spread westwards of these kind of technology. But it's important to stress that there were some Russian weapons already um, that, uh, in fact, stand out as being rather old-fashioned sort of migration-era vibe that, as you know, leaves on in, in the Viking swords. And, and often highly decorated, the latter especially a, a step uh, influence, right? Step warriors tended to overload their arms and armor with wealth because they literally carried it with them and they were more easily recognizable politically, militarily on the base of that, that accomplishment. We go to the uh, chronological extreme of our, uh, today's timeline, looking at, um, at the icon of St. Nicholas from Novgorod. Uh, it's today preserved at uh, you know St. Petersburg, uh, and it dates to the early 14th century. And there is a weapon which can easily be, uh, or clearly is telling the truth, a later form of the so-called Danish axe, that, as you know, was also essentially a Frankish thing that eventually was just more, say, uh, given that you can't really use it on horseback in more of a functional way. So given the Scandinavians had on average less cavalry than the Franks, it would take on that sort of idea that, again, a guy on foot could use double-handed weapons. This is the same case from the Grand de Pays d'Allemagne that the French were observing in Germany. This is not just about the physical prowess that you really need. Of course, these races were pretty sturdy and tough, but it's also the combination of some sort of feudal el elitism that allows you to, to train, to wield this in also costly weapon, um, uh, essentially to, to destroy everything you have in front of you, um, causing internal trauma, either managing to, at some point, break improperly through armor, um, just out of sheer force and precision of the angle of the hit, even though combat is a total mess, to say the least. Um, because they were also more likely to fight on foot. Sometimes even dismounting, having these weapons with them, not necessarily using them on, on horseback. Um, also because, again, in this case it would have not really been possible, but just in function of a dismounting. Uh, and um, there are, especially this upward sweeping blade is um, to be found uh, this exemplar depicted also in among other western types of Danish axes right it um, strikes also the connection with the later upward sweeping and distinctively so 15th 16th century birdish that as you know remained a bit like a, this typical weapon between Poland uh, Russia, etc. It's the long after axe uh, that in 16th, 17th century w European warfare, you also know as called as Bardish 
war axe. And so um, in these areas, even though cavalry, as you know, was quite a thing, still there were terrains that would, that would allow you to employ these types of weapons, or at least as they could be employed also by militia, not just by a dismounted cavalry. But still, they were fierce weapons, as you know, used also by guard units. It's similar like the Varangians in the Byzantine army had. Always bearing in mind that um, that was may have passed as sort of national weapon, but actually these units were true sort of autonomous armies that were mostly equipped with a much more complete and much more sort of um, diversified panoply, in you know, a much more canonic way. Right? So, the Danish axe for the Varangians is, is a meme just for the elite uh, uh, at most. So these guys used uh, lots of different weapons even as, as, as the elite elements. Naturally no overview about Russian warfare would be complete without attention to Byzantine influences. But we will observe that especially in the second part uh, of the video. I want to talk now more about the later influence from Western Europe, actually the one that uh, had always been existing, right, uh, even more than from Scandinavia. This is important to stress, I mean we uh, we think again the uh, we, we are fascinated with the Vikings. We, we talk about the Viking era. We think that everything that happened around the, the beginning of this time was the Vikings, right? But actually, right, and as you know, especially from my channel, you know, this pop culture obsession for the Vikings actually um, hides a grotesque uh, and absolute ignorance, basically, in any aspect of continental a European history that was dramatically more advanced than anything that the Vikings had in a military sense, um, civilizationally. Just this is not a matter of saying, oh wow, these were warlike people. Well, every, everyone there was, was waging war in pretty darn uh, advanced and sophisticated ways. And Western Europe had, even throughout the Viking era, a, a much more um, relevant impact in the development of Russian um, warfare than we think. And this was increasing in the following centuries as well, so because the same Scandinavians were fundamentally overwhelmed by by that. I mean, they began to, to enter fully in that Frankish uh, uh, material culture. We have a sword from uh, Kamenets Podolsky, wearing Galicia. Uh, this dates to likely the, the first half of the 11th century comes from the ex uh, uh collection and this uh, weapon uh, is thus coming from just a, a bit north of, of the Carpathian Mountains right? it dates from the formation of what was the first Rusian kingdom as we've seen in the video about um, Galicia Volinia by the way uh, this was, again, the, the single most westernly influenced uh, region of, in the entire Rus. He is in the full Western European tradition. It has this bros, likely Kurt Guillon, a terrified pommel. However, it has also an exotic and almost as, uh, Islamic arabesque uh, style uh, decoration, which is quite elaborated, by the way, so this could speak both of um, step influence, but also something coming from, say, uh, trade with the Middle East, um, etc. Regarding even in there a nomadic ostentation of wealth, but also some sort of more elaborated local styles. We have a broken sword from Grob dated to the 11th and 12th century. Um, the pommel is cocked hat in design, which is a characteristic of later Central Europe. It, uh, it's a fragmentary weapon in the way it 
was documented. We do not know where it is now, I think, by the way, because some were documented, but then we do not know where they ended, where the actual piece ended. Uh, in any case, it's possible that um, this um, mm, cocked hat design for the pommel, which may make you think that of this design developed before in Eastern Europe and then passed to Central Europe, but it's more likely for this um, uh, weapon actually to have been a German export to the Rus, uh, and that this was this happened in uh, in actually later time. That this was an older sword from Central Europe that already displayed that cocked head. Um, design of pommel and that was reused right, in, by some Eastern European uh, later on. We have the so-called helmet of Yaroslav uh, uh, Volodovich. Uh, this helmet would date to the late 12th, early 13th century. It's preserved at the Kremlin and uh, it's a famous one because it was dropped at the Battle of Lipetsk in 1216, we will see this at some point, and found at Lukovo, that is in the east of Moscow. And the interesting aspect of this is like in the uh, earth of, actually not even the earth, like the some of the eastern most, most underdeveloped places of the Rus, as you know Moscow was a newcomer uh, in, the, in the system, uh, it is actually a Norman looking helmet, right? Fully within the Western European tradition. It has this beautiful uh, metal icon uh, over the brow, which uh, was likely added. This seems uh, like a you know, more local decoration. But in this case, you, you do see how uh, Far East uh, Western weapons traveled and how was say completely normal actually for Russian uh, knights just to have Rusinas, let's put it in this way, um, to to actually enjoy uh, this kind of Western weapons, which were evidently imported w willingly from from pretty far away in order to be there. I mean, you could find different paths, but it's it's something that you do not really. Uh, need and that also doesn't appear in this systemic e frequency you wouldn't think there to, to have a particularly functional purpose instead right it's something um, common as we've seen we have the sword and scabbard of Prince Dovmon we do not know uh, whether this is a Russian or Lithuanian weapon. In any case, it dates to the 13th century. It's preserved in Pskov at the local historical museum. Um, and the interesting aspect about this find is that both uh, sword and scabbard are perfectly preserved in the tomb of this prince um, that was actually a Lithuanian leader but had been exiled in Russian territory as was happening in their clashes let's say, between Lithuanians. And I, made, I made a bit about medieval Lithuania exactly in this period, and that ex tells you why it was going on, because different factions supported, especially after the Mongol invasion, um, this or that Lithuanian ruler just to alter the, the outcome of the Lithuanian subjugation of Ruthenia, basically. Uh, and, surprise, surprise, <laughs> this sword and scabbard is typically, are typically and purely Western European. Probably they were made in Germany. Right? So other ravagingly impacting evidence of the uh, well, the Teutonic Knights were just next door, right? So there's nothing really to be surprised of. But it, it's something that uh, at least in pop culture you don't think about. Right? There is this sort of Easternism, aestheticistic Easternism about everything that is sort of Eastern European has to look like a lamellar and with and tail, etc. And then you, f you realize that the finest people at the time in these countries were using typically um, Western uh, weapons, which is fantastic. 
not just that we will see it better now we have um, a mace head from Novgorod from the ex Kirpichnikov um, it could be from a uh, broader uh, say northern Rus dating to the 13th century um, this actually resembles a mm, southern Rus in her Middle Eastern uh, manufacture because of the form, the technique of decoration, etc. It's a relatively light weapon, would have probably been just uh, mounted on a long haft of some sort, which is not necessarily a Western influence, but it speaks of some more kind of uh, tactical diversification or maybe well, I mean these weapons would have existed around um, but uh, it, it, the same Novgorod had important militias that sort of lived a bit uh, the, the legacy of the earlier uh, you know levies we've seen before um, in any case uh, that's an indicator of some sort of infantry power that remains um, here and there in this sea of sort of autocratization of the system. The carved st stone icon coming from western Ukraine representing St. George, it's preserved at St. Petersburg now, uh, it dates to the mid 13th century. Uh, and um, it's a rather unusual pictorial source uh, for, say, Russian warfare this time, but the most important thing is that St. George is wearing a purely European full male hauberk. It also has a kite-shaped shield, right? And this, um, may the latter especially is a bit, uh, also the, the, the full male hauberk just without additions at this point, plate armor is coming around, etc. Um, the, but the kite-shaped shield especially is something slightly older, so it could speak either of some sort of uh, archaism uh, of the sort of Byzantine type but applied to say what were the older things that we saw from the Westerners rather uh, and or actually the possibility of this sort of older outdated arms and armor that Eastern Europe had from the West in some way and that would have been common in still a functional, uh, definitely a functional panoply for for these local knights, right? We have the icon of the saints Gleb and Boris. This comes from 13th century central Russia. It's preserved in Moscow at the Tretyakov Gallery. And it's um, very stylized as you would expect from from orthodox icons but the swords depicted definitely show large round pommels and long quillon and these are very similar to the ones you would find in mid 13th century germany all right so it's obvious that uh, central european western european arms and armor were being imported uh, in the russian heartland already by this point uh, from these times you also have seals as you know, uh, depicting rulers at times um, and uh, being modeled after the Western examples themselves. Um, this is fascinating because the same art, of course, was a mean also to depict, uh, say, to influence the the, the design of weapons in, on these sources um, that may have been imaginary thus, but more likely, you know, depicting maybe what these local rulers wanted to look like. So something, let's say, mm, as we've seen in Poland, for example, in other um, uh, these uh, seal sources for other countries, um, the most updated Western stuff, right? Here it's not quite the same. I mean, the style does resemble the, one of the Western seals, mostly from Central Europe, say, the German influence you find also in Poland. Um, you find also warrior figures with spears, straight sword, kite-shaped shields, right? And even a, a later shield with a flattened top, which was going a bit towards the, 
uh, not say the shields were getting flatter and smaller in the west. Um, here, rather, we've seen in in other areas, also in the Balkans, etc., that this flat sh uh, shield were also created to facilitate the shield wall thing we were saying before against horse archery. Consider that at this point you have the Mongols around, so uh, not everything develops around the same patterns of of the West because of this fierce host that you can't quite uh, ignore, especially when it's next door asking for tributes and threatening you with, with actual campaigns. We have an icon on the life of St. George coming from northern the northern Rus. This dates to the first half of the 14th century. It's preserved at the uh, Russian Museum of St. Petersburg. It shows different um, figures, uh, including the typical the um, archaic looking Byzantine and South Roman styled uh, ones. But together with this you find from the details, right, um, interesting Western influences such as the style of saddle of St. George himself. Um, and there is a strange element on his horse's bridle, by the way, but we can't really connect it to anything uh, particular. We see some later Byzantine and Balkan characteristics too. For example, splinted and laminated, laminated neck protections. The latter were something, especially in countries like Serbia, etc. And we can impute this uh, to the Mongol presence also in the Balkans, once of other nomadic peoples launching periodic raids, well, especially after the collapse of the Byzantine Empire, sort of the privatization of the system, thinking about the, the Kumans and so on. Um, we find a uh, straight and tapering European style sword. Shields, uh, the shields are actually a bit old fashioned, right? Uh, we see men wearing apparently male shawls. So here we are in the later Middle Ages and so things had began to become more complex just in the panoply also some more peripheral areas of Europe. But it's worth appreciating again still the Western influence. You would think that at this point these guys were cut off or at least it was a crisis that had engulfed them and deprived them of the possibility of you know connecting with the West more easily. That's not actually the case. Actually Western influence is to be seen as we've seen in Balkan warfare and Byzantine warfare very strong uh, way. Um, finally, and we will pass to something more detailed about properly the Kivan military in the next video, we can appreciate a bit more of uh, external influence. As we've seen, the Eurasian steppes really were that important. Lamellar armor, uh, together with the Byzantine context, was really uh, iconic in, in, in the Rus'. Uh, the same goes for composite bows that were used uh, in some parts of the Rus, uh, both by cavalry and, uh, and infantry. Uh, arguably, cavalry uh, as also just elite, uh, more multifunctional, sort of, there were sort of horse archers as well, but say, it would have not been strange for a Rusian uh, Drudzna to retinue just to be equipped with composite bow as a secondary weapon, right? Whereas the average peasant, right, somewhere in the, in the Russian forest would have been just much more using, you know, simpler bows, um, being more traditional in that regard. So that's completely normal for the, for the elite to be more international, and so more updated for sort of more multitask uh, functions. But it's also some parts of the Rus that were simply more exposed to composite bows, so at the frontier with the stamp it was not strange you know, to see more composites. Curved sabers were an important thing, as we've seen before, uh, among the Eastern Slavs already from the 10th century, there is all uh, a, a question that we'll have to address in a dedicated video regarding the properly the development of Eastern uh, let's say of Slavic cavalry as a whole, right? But the Eastern one is the most mysterious of all because 
uh, albeit the most surely the most influenced by steps warfare was is also the least documented right so we have to understand how certain things happened but just consider that even at the beginning of the 11th century the the poles had seemingly um one third of their men mounted of course they weren't as heavy as say the the, the westerners uh, that had in this sense much more infantry but also much heavier cavalry and also heavier infantry in general compared to the east um it's just again a different world but i mean one third of the guys mounted really speaks especially for poland that is not really you know it's not the steps right um for a sanitary people really a remarkable equestrian influence that surely came from the steps in that regard and so you can imagine the rules that were literally in between how more even more shaded were in, in this sense uh, in any case when we look at sabers uh, we um, we have to appreciate that uh, in spite of the presence of other single-edged blades um, that were also reminiscent of this crime sax that we've seen for the Baltic peoples and so on um, there were secondary weapons um, we do not really see the saber much beyond the southern frontiers right for for many centuries I mean later on yes you have the Mongols the space is open a little bit there is there is also just a more diversified type of combat that towards the later Middle Ages starts emerging at least in the types of troops that are ever more professionally and uh, say differentiated in the professional retinues um, but before right uh, the again the the Slavs of the forests would maintain a again a much more similar profile to the ones of Central Europe than than the steppes um, the Rus had uh, surely uh, their own military industry which also uh, influenced the military culture of their its neighbors right this is something we can appreciate as we've seen better talking paradoxically about other people and saying well this thing looks quite Russian uh, we've seen it again uh, in other episodes uh, consider that the great uh, Russian cities uh, by the 13th century were really large right they had come again they had emerged through a very different mechanism from the ones of Western urbanization but they were prosper right and they had significant armories that these traditions lived on even after the Mongols etc it was an important especially with the autocratic government kicking in an importantly concentrated um, level of production and distribution of arms and armor uh, and uh, th there's all a tradition lives on throughout the, the, the modern age etc it's fair to say that most of the Russian arms and armor exported would end up in places like northern and central Europe uh, especially in the 10th and 11th century uh, but also in Volga Bulgaria in the 12th and the 13th right as well as of course other neighboring lands but it's relevant because especially for the first period you do have this inter exchange for which yes we see you think again the, the the Vikings entered Eastern Europe whatever yes but this place was already significantly developed I mean what we see with the Varangians the Rikid dynasty is again mostly a Slavic accomplishment the, the Norse were surely pretty darn good um, mercenaries they helped this local chiefs to sort of uh, coalesced they they married into their families etc but generally speaking the the blood and soul of the land was Slavic right and it did the, the local mechanisms were fundamentally um, more advanced even than certain Scandinavian ones right so it's again something that uh, one may want to appreciate looking at things in depth we really have to make lots of videos about the Viking era that we really have it like lots of um, historical units types that really uh, explain it all right talking about I don't know making a video about the 10th century Slavic horsemen uh, especially from I don't know Eastern Europe uh, well it's one of those things you you want to really appreciate uh, if we get in the depths of 
And so again, this was the f just the first part of Rusian Warfare. Uh, I will think tomorrow upload um, the rest. Um, for today, stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.